Hello everyone, about ready to start my workshop on fantasy world building. I'll also be reading from my debut, uh, We Are the Fire, as well as giving a sneak peek of my Icelandic historical fantasy, Wicked is the Witch. This is part of the Snomola Live workshops all this week and all next week. We're doing classes for kids, tweens, and teens of all ages to help support families right now who um, you know, the schools are shut down because of the virus, and so we're just pulling together our resources as authors and illustrators of Stimola Literary to do what we can to help support families at this time with so many kids at home worried, needing something to do. So, hope that we can all pitch in. All right. So, thanks everyone who is joining in. Ah, I see people waving. Hello. Okay. So, um, I am young adult author Sam Taylor. Um, this workshop is going to be focusing on two parts. I'm going to be first talking about secondary world fantasies, or that is, fantasies that are in a completely made up world. And then I'm going to be talking about historical fantasies, or fantasies that are grounded in real world history and folklore. And I'll be walking through my process for building the worlds in two of my stories as examples. So we're going to start with the secondary world fantasy and as I talk through this I'm going to be walking you through how I built the world for my debut We Are the Fire. It'll be coming out next February 16th with Swoon Reads Macmillan. Pitch for this story is two teen soldiers in love pitted against each other in an empire of fire magic and ash gray morals. It is Ember in the Ashes with fire magic. So when you're building a fantasy story, or any story really, you're always going to be starting with a premise, you know, a hook, an idea, the seed of the story idea. This can be different for any project, it can be different by author, there's no one right way to get this story idea or the story seed. Sometimes you'll start with a character, you get an idea for a character that you want to follow in the world. Sometimes you get an idea for a really interesting plot point or a twist that you might enjoy writing about. Sometimes you start the story with a question. What if questions are very, uh, very popular, very common ways to start stories. For We Are the Fire, this book started with an emotion for me, which is probably why it is one of my most intense and relentless manuscripts to date. A long, long story short, my day job at the time was led by some very corrupt people. The one person who could have helped wanted nothing to do with the problem, pretty much washed their hands of the whole affair. I was trying to fix it. I didn't know what the right thing to do was. It was very frustrating, very discouraging. I wanted to watch something burn. That was how I got the idea for the story. I wanted to watch something burn. I wanted to write a story about an arsonist, magical arsonist, people who could light fires with magic. So I had my story idea. I needed to then build a world to suit this premise. I needed a world where people, young people, teenagers had this ability to light magical fires, but that ability didn't make them powerful. They weren't on top of the world. They were on the bottom. They were being forced to take orders, forced to do things they didn't want to do. So I thought, what if there were an empire and these fire wielding teen soldiers were in its army, not by choice. They didn't want to be part of this army. They were made to fight in it. Their home countries had been conquered by this empire. They were taken from their homes at very young ages and forced to, forced to fight. Uh, see, it says someone keeps stopping to load. I hope, I hope this is going through. Okay, anyway. Um, so they were being taken from a young age and forced to fight, given these fire powers. That was another thing was, I didn't want them to be born with these powers. They were, forced to have these powers, they weren't given them by choice. So how did they actually get these fire powers? This was where I turned to the real world for some inspiration and I looked at alchemy um, in our world. I played really fast and loose with alchemy as it happened in our world, which is one of the beauties of secondary fantasy is you're not limited by our world's you know, rules and the way things worked out. So alchemy in our world in the medieval and renaissance times it's a philosophy of changing substances from one material to another, trying to get a more valuable or more perfected or more ideal state for that object. So 
um, a lot of times in our world you'd see some of the most common ways you'd see alchemy was they're trying to change base metals into gold or they're trying to create this elixir of immortality or they'd be trying to create this substance that could cure all diseases any diseases it seemed like a a good launching point for the magic in my world. It was alchemy in our world. This is a very mystical form of science. It did leave its mark on um, early modern science in our world and you know, chemistry and medicine especially. So I decided to play fast and loose with alchemy and to create an alchemy for this story world where the the alchemists are using this special stone in their world to take ordinary humans and turn them into these beings who can, with a single spark, can breathe it into a bonfire. So, as you're building the world for your secondary fantasy, in addition to you know, setting up a world that suits the premise, you're also going to want to be thinking about the time period for the story. In, in decades past, kind of the default for secondary fantasy is the pseudo-medieval world. And you don't have to stick with that anymore. You know, really think about what kind of time period suits the characters you're writing about, suits the, the, the story that you're trying to build. Because the time period you set it in, you're going to end up with a vastly different set of characters and a vastly different story if you put it in one time period versus another. So really think about what time period suits the story you're trying to tell. Do you want it set in an ancient world? Do you want it set in a modern day contemporary world? I wanted fire to be set in an industrial age sort of world, one that's on the very cusp of technology, not quite there. There's a steam locomotive that appears several times in the story. It seems like it's just being mentioned in passing, but by the end of the story, that steam locomotive plays a really critical part in the climax and the ending. There's also a telegraph mentioned as well. Again, it's like here and there, it almost just seems like a throwaway, you know, an item in passing, but it also becomes very critical to the story. So think about the time period you want it set in. You don't have to just, you know, hop to the, the default medieval time period. Think about what time period really suits the story you're trying to tell and the the, the characters that you envision having in the story. You need to create a history for your world as well. And one that explains why the, the society functions the way it does, why it's set up the way it does, why the people behave the way they do, what is motivating them to make the choices they are, especially when they're making bad choices. For We Are the Fire, I had to ask, why are these terrible people even doing these things? Why is there an empire? going into other countries and kidnapping their children and bringing them back and transforming them into beings who can sling around fire. What are the reasons and motivations for doing this? So I told myself stories about the world, um, made up for the fire world, made up five different countries. Vesima is the one that started all the trouble. Once upon a time, Vesima was just a happy little rural country where they had their farms, and they had their families, and they loved their families, and they loved their food, and they loved songs and music. And, you know, they, they had their cottages, and they were just a peaceful little community. They also had these mines here, full of a mineral called Verakibi. It's a bright red stone, highly combustible. To them, you know, it wasn't anything particularly special. But to the Skamal country above them, this was a fierce country of mountains and steel mills and shipyards and strong people who were proud of their strength and they weren't afraid to take from others when they saw something useful to them. So they see this country, Vesima, that's full of good fertile farmland and woods with lots of natural resources and the very Kiwi mines with the combustible stones and they think we can use those stones to make ourselves even stronger. So they invade Vesima going after all the land, going after the mines. Vesemen started fighting back because they just wanted their homes. They just wanted their country back. So they started, they fought before like anyone else with, with swords and with cannons and it wasn't working. They weren't strong enough to defeat Skamal. So the, the Vesemen alchemists are like, we can take these Barakivi stones that are causing so much trouble, the, the reason Skamal's invading us, and we can use them to transform our ordinary regular soldiers 
and to people who can fight with fire. It was like nothing the world had ever seen, um, and it was nothing. The Scoville Nation was prepared to fight. So they sent the Vesemen fire soldiers, sent the Scoville's packing back into their land. Vesemen didn't stop there. They wanted to make sure that Scommel could never ever threaten their land again, but they needed stronger soldiers to do that. They needed even more soldiers to do that. They wanted to conquer Scommel and make sure that Scommel could never again invade their land. The alchemist realized, hey, if, you know, when they had started the transformations, they were just working with their ordinary, regular grown soldiers who were grown, chose to fight, trained to fight in their army, but they said, if we use our alchemy to transform children who are still growing and still developing, they can become even stronger fighters with fire. No one can challenge them. And they decided we need more soldiers as well. So they turned to the countries surrounding them. They were much stronger than these countries by now. And one by one, they conquered the countries and they took their children whenever they needed more soldiers and they brought them back to the capital city and transformed them. So they took Horadim, which is a country of mountains and rural villages and wheat fields. This is Oksana's country, Oksana, one of the main characters. They conquered Bacostra, a land of jungles and tropics and waterfalls and big sweeping cities. This is Pran's country, the main character. They conquered the the permafrost tundras of Nida. This is a land of reindeer herders and nomadic families who are just following the reindeers along their natural migration routes. So I'm going to show you here. This is the art I commissioned of my main characters, Pran and Oksana. So I told myself the histories of this world. I told myself folklores about these stories about these these people, the stories that they tell themselves. You need to know the history of the world, but you also need to come up with the folklore of the world, the stories that people tell themselves to make their world make sense to them. And when you get all of that together and you really get the understanding of the why society works the way it does and what the characters are fighting against, then you can really build a solid society and a solid structure for what these characters are living in every day, the how and the why, what they're living in. So in conclusion, wrapping up for secondary fantasy, you're going to start with a premise or some seed of a story idea. You're going to build a world that supports this idea, makes it possible. You need to choose a time period that supports the story you're trying to tell. Really think about how that time period serves the story. Think about how it enables the, the types of characters that you're envisioning, the types of challenges those characters need to overcome. Think about also how it complicates it, makes things a little bit more difficult, makes things more interesting, more, more for the characters to overcome. Give that world personality and flavors all of its own and develop a history, mythology, folklore that provides motivation and explanations for why the society functions the way it does, um, why the people are behaving the way they do. All right, so who wants to hear a little excerpt from We Are the Fire? I'm gonna read a short part from uh, chapter three. S what's been happening so far in the story is um, at this point in chapter three, from Pran's point of view, Pran and Oksana just received a rank advancement for their part in helping control a rebellious group of fire soldiers that night. The One of the youngest groups of soldiers, the Scarlet Ember Troop, the, one of the lowest ranking ones, broke from the fortress that night while Pran and Oksana were out on patrol in the city. They, the soldiers broke through, broke from the fort, ran through the city, burned down an entire village outside, just outside the emperor, the, the capital city. Um, they were brought back to the fortress and burnt for their rebellion. Um, Pran and Oksana were trying to stop them and figure out what on earth is going on with these troops. What are they doing? Um, so no one's really sure what is going on with that rebellious troop of soldiers, why they did what they did, but it's gotten the whole fortress shaken. But Pran and Oksana, for their work and trying to get it under control, were, are 
being promoted in rank. So neither one of them is particularly happy about this promotion. They're trying to figure out what it means for them and what they need to do. So as they're leaving the tower, right after they get the promotion, outside the tower, Pran and Oksana trudge toward the barracks, the fortress silent except for their footsteps and the distant call of one messenger to another. Behind them, Commander Tower glowed with gray-green light in almost every window, but before them, the grounds were dark and empty as Tuli's attempted a few hours of sleep before fifth bell. Ixana still held her Hellion's tunic at arm's length. How can we become this? Prawn glanced around, but there was no sign of anyone else, so he led Ixana into the shadows between two training yards. Leaning against a wall, he drew her close until their breaths blended and their hearts beat as one. It's a role, he said, a part to assume, and these uniforms, a costume. We can play the commander's games, and in the meantime, transform this rank into whatever suits us. What are you talking about? He wasn't sure, exactly, but an answer lurked in that bright orange demon burning up from the uniform. If he could only scrape together the pieces. This rank gives us power here, and there must be some way we can use it to do more. The Scarlet Embers made a statement tonight. Maybe we can make a bigger one finish what they started. We don't know what they were doing. We never will, because they're dead. They destroyed an entire village, people, families, murdered in their homes. That's not a statement. That's horrific. A chill pulse, pulse through Pran's veins. He had little love for any vestments, but still, no one knew better than a Tulicobet what it was to have a home shattered. The embers were too new and inexperienced. They didn't have the skills or authority in fire, planning, control, to do better. As Hellions, we do. We must. We can't go on living this way. And his wrecked leg, always so helpful, so outstanding with its timing, flared with a pain that sucked away his breath, killing the strength in his last words and leaving him slumped across Oksana's shoulder. How, Pran? She pressed her head against his. How will we do better? He wished he had an answer, a plan for how they could break from this fort. Leave it all behind and stay free, not be dragged back in chains and burned at stakes with the fire of their own creation. It hurt as much as his thigh, admitting he didn't know, that all he had was hope. But after seven years in this fort, hope was nothing to scoff at. Seven years surviving meant they were capable of so much more. We'll find a way. You and I, we've always found a way. When we were novices, you didn't want to cast fire, but you learned it to teach me so I'd stay alive. We'll do that again, but stronger. Learn everything they demand from us as Hellions, and use all of it to turn this fort on its head. We'll make our lives our own, and we'll do it at each other's side. Before he could talk himself out of it again, he plucked the ring from his pocket. It was silver, a thin band engraved with roses, poppies, yarrow, and peonies, exactly like the wreath she talked of wearing at dance festivals with her mother and sister. Oksana's jaw dropped. Where did you get that? He'd stolen this ring during a mission last spring. He'd been sent out before nightfall, when the markets were still open, and while slinking through the shadows behind stalls, a silver gleam caught his eye. The moment he saw this ring, he wanted it for Oksana, something so clearly from her homeland. Then he saw the words inside, in Hordodimian no less, Ya abits chayu, I promise. A flush bloomed across Oksana's cheeks. You promise what? That was what he hadn't known for so long. How could he promise anything when he had no control over his life? But after tonight, this change in rank, he would not spend such power groveling to the commander's whims. His hand shook so badly he could hardly slide the ring onto her finger. I don't know what our future holds. He cupped her face in his hands, and only then did they go still. But I want to give us freedom, and I'd like to share it with you. She was silent for so long, he feared he'd said the wrong thing. Perhaps these claims, this ring, was too absurd, too much this impossible night. But then she leaned close until her breath fluttered like a moth against his jaw. That is a future worth fighting for. And before he could laugh, before he could say a word of his own, she tangled her hands in his hair and kissed him until Pran could have summoned a fire with the heat surging through him. He pressed her against the wall, her soft lip caught between his teeth, and kissed her until they both gasped, their ragged breaths tangling together. They kissed until his heart pounded so fiercely he thought it might burst from his chest. They kissed until he could barely stand, until he didn't want to stand, and his shirt was in the way, too. But when he scooted from her to tug it off, Oksana leapt on him, closing the distance. They kissed until the first bell clanged, reminding Pran where they stood, and that no place in this fort was safe. I'm sorry, he said as he broke away. 
Aksana's shoulders slumped when she glanced at the training fields and Commander Tower always looming above them. He caught one of her hunched shoulders and squeezed. In the morning, when we walk into that yard, we'll be together. We'll figure this out together. So there's a little peek at We Are the Fire. The book itself will be released in February 16th, 2021. The cover for that will probably be coming up soon, and pre-order links should follow that not too much long later. I'll definitely be posting here on Instagram once the cover is available. All right, on to historical fantasy. So I'm going to be giving you a sneak peek here at my Icelandic historical fantasy, Wicked is the Witch. This is currently on submission right now to um, some publishers here in the United States. So, you know, cross your fingers, cross your toes, cross your heart that this book finds an uh, editor in a publishing house who are willing to give it a home. And it'll also be a book in a bookstore soon. So pitch for Wicked is the Witch. This book is Inception in 1904 Iceland with Viking Age magic. It is a heist book full of all kinds of magical hijinks. Rockle, a young witch with illegal mind magic powers, she can cast illusions, she can trick people into giving up their secrets. She's indentured to a blackmailer and must steal secrets for him or else he's going to give her and her adopted brother over to the police. So, just as with any book, you are going to always start with some sort of premise. For this book, I knew I wanted to write a steampunk story. I knew I wanted to write a story where steam technology was deeply woven into the world building and the plot, that this was a story that could not take place without the, the steam technology. I also had songs from the Icelandic band Monsters of Men uh, knock, knocking around in my brain, especially their song Little Talks, um, which is a song about you know, someone who is being tricked by their own mind. They don't really know what's right or real anymore. And that ended up feeding back into Rockle with her mind magic, which, you know, she can, she can cast illusions and play tricks on people's minds. But as the story goes on, her magic starts to rebound until she is being tricked and deceived by her own magic and she no longer knows what is real. So I still wanted this story to be fantasy, but it, because I was going to set it in a place like Iceland, you know, inspired by this Icelandic band and steampunk, and I was like, oh, there's, you know, steam vents, there's natural hot springs. Iceland is a land that is begging for a steampunk story. So this was the first story I'd written that was set in a real world. Before this, everything else, all my other stories had been in secondary world fantasies, stories that I had, um, you know, been making up the worlds for them. This time I was going different. I was going to set it in a real world setting, Iceland. I was like, okay, if I'm going to set a story in a real time and a real history, then I'm going to lean into that history as much as possible. And I knew I wanted to really do my research and build this on as much facts as possible while still keeping it fantasy and magical and fun. So when you are writing historical fantasy, you have to be prepared to do a lot of research. Uh, you know, as much research as if you would be writing just a straight up regular historical fiction novel. I decided I wanted to set this book in 1904 because it was such a pivotal year for Iceland. Technology wise, it was the year that the first car was brought to Iceland. Thompson car, it was called because it was owned by a man named Thompson. It was also the year that steam powered trawlers were put to use in the Icelandic fishing industry. Um, politically, this was the year that Iceland gained back sovereignty from Denmark and they were granted their own prime minister. What does that mean? Brief history lesson time. So Iceland was set, most likely settled by um, Viking travelers in the year 874. They were, com most of them were coming from Norway looking for, you know, lands to settle, claim as their own, get a little peace from, from Norway. Some of them were escaping family feuds or you know, murders they had committed. This was a very ferocious time. So in Iceland, they found a good place to you know, set up, make their own homes. And they lived in Iceland for several hundred years in relative prosperity. More people came, there was lots of land to claim. They did pretty well in Iceland for a while. Um, 
But then they went back to feuding amongst themselves. Families were trying to rule over each other, take power over each other. They weakened themselves. They ended up falling prey um, to, they fell under rule by Norway for a while. Then they fell under rule by Denmark for hundreds of years. They did not do well under Danish rule. Iceland was already really isolated from the rest of the world and the rest of Scandinavia. And then under Danish rule, they were kept really restricted, um, especially economically. There was a lot of rules about what they could export, import. They were kept in poverty for centuries, basically. In the 18th century, they were able to gain a bit more economic freedoms and get themselves a little bit out of the poverty. In the 19th century, there was a sweep of nationalism, not just in Iceland, but around the world. A lot of countries wanting to take back their nation, take back their freedom, take back their politics. And Iceland was one of those. In the year 1874, so 1,000 years after the first Vikings came to settle Iceland, they were granted their own constitution from Denmark. And then in 1904, they were allowed an Icelandic price minister. So someone who actually lived in Iceland, you know, knew their people, was one of their people, they were allowed that prime minister to govern their own needs. So how did I research for this book? I read history books written by Icelanders. I read culture books written by Icelanders. Alda Sigmundotter's Little Books of Iceland series was immensely helpful to me. She has books about their culture now. She has books about their history and culture in, you know, centuries ago. She has a book about their language and idioms. She has books about their folklore and mythology. Um, I also studied lots of old photographs. The Reykjavik Museum of Photography has a lot of photographs online, especially on Flickr. I was able to find dozens of photos from the early 1900s and it was so helpful to be able to visualize Reykjavik as my characters would have seen and experienced it. Uh, I studied old maps of Reykjavik at the time and I also used Google Maps, the street used to virtually walk through Reykjavik. I mean obviously this is the modern day version of the city but it was still really helpful while I was doing the early drafts of the story to like get a feel for the layout of the city that way. I hired a sensitivity reader and a history expert once I was a few drafts in to go through the story and just double check and make sure that I didn't have any you know, embarrassing inaccuracies or you know insensitive parts of the story. So through a friend of a friend I was able to make contact with a university student in Iceland who studied their history. He also worked at the Open Air Museum on the edge of Reykjavik, which is a preserved section of the city with houses and buildings that are um, kind of like refurbished from around the time period of the story. So he had a lot of great insights. He was especially good at giving me the historical details that I had been struggling to find. Um, like, what are the buildings made out of? Uh, how was the harbor laid out and some of the names. So it was immensely helpful. I was also eventually able to visit the city in person. This was a visit that I had been wanting to make for quite a while, but due to different life events, it just didn't work out. Uh, but when I sold fire, I was able to take some of the money from the advance and use that to fund a trip to Reykjavik. So I was there for a few days and it was amazing to just be able to walk through the city and see so many of these buildings I'd been writing about because I had seen so many old photographs, I could recognize them as I was coming up to them. I didn't even need the map to tell me. Reykjavik is a great city for historical research because the Icelanders are very proud of their history and rightfully so. So they have a lot of their old buildings very carefully preserved and then in downtown Reykjavik, you're going around looking at all these old buildings and they have placards and signs in front of them with photographs and more history. It was amazing. I was taking so many pictures. It was an excellent trip. So why do I tell you all this? That was a lot of history and a lot of information on historical research. Because when you're writing fantasy grounded in the real world and real history, you have to know what you're writing about. You, know, you have to write it with respect. You have to write it with you know, a real sense of what is happening, what was happening in the world at that time. For steampunk, you also need to do a little bit of research on technology. So even though steampunk itself is you know, a bit of a 
speculative sci-fi fantastical subgenre in itself, I still wanted to keep the steampunk technology in this book grounded in as much real world history as possible as well. So I went to a steampunk convention here in Connecticut, the Brass Ring Academy. I attended a presentation by a professor of Victorian history and he was talking about kooky inventions that existed in Victorian times, but never really took off for one reason or another. And he talked about the steam powered bicycle. So think of like a early prototype of the motorcycle. It was created by a man named Sylvester H. Roper. And these were real, these steam powered bicycles were real um, items. They, there were several different models that were developed that existed. They were never mass produced, never really went on sale to the public. Um, Sylvester H. Roper, the man who invented them, actually died on one. There's, there's a news article that is on the internet about it, and I actually dropped this news article into the Iceland book just to like put in a bit more history. So um, he died while test driving one. He crashed his bicycle, he had a heart attack. Did the crash call, cause the heart attack, or did the heart attack cause the crash? We don't know, we will never know, but you know, kind of needless to say, the bicycles weren't very popular after that and never went on sale to the public widely. But I was like, this is such a great invention, it has to be in this story. I could just see it come to life and kind of being a character in its own right. Um, and so in, so indeed, indeed it did. I put the bicycle into the story. Rockle's adopted brother, Lafer, is a huge gearhead, huge steam geek, loves these bicycles. He pulls one off a junk heap because they're indentured to a block. I mean, that's the only way they're gonna get one. They don't have money to buy a good bike. So he pulls one off a junk heap and he's always fiddling with it and working on it. And Rockle hates it because it's such a piece of junk and she is so sure he's gonna die on it like Sylvester H. Roper. And does bad things happen to Lafer and Rockle when they're on this bike? You'll have to read the book to find out. But the steam bicycles in the story were a real thing, just, just not quite the way I have them in the book. I bent history a little so that they are all the rage in Iceland and around the world. So similar also to when, as I mentioned, when building your secondary fantasy for historical fantasy, in addition to the history, you're also gonna wanna know the folklore the stories that people tell themselves to make sense of their world. Icelanders love their stories. They love them now. They loved it centuries ago. They have their own set of folklore, the Icelandic sagas, which are books and books full of stories um, of early settlers in Iceland. Are these stories fact? Are they fiction? Probably some of both. The Viking Age magic is really prominent in a lot of these Icelandic saga stories. and. That, when I was, as I was researching, that was something I was like, the story's missing something. You know, I have all this great steampunk technology, but this story is missing something. What is it? It's missing magic, obviously. And Iceland, you know, and their history is full of magic. So I took some of the different kinds of magic that were mentioned in the Icelandic sagas and plopped them into my Iceland story. So there's spow, which is divination, seeing the future. There's the singing and chanting magic. You know, spells and songs that people would sing to get blessings and healing and protection. There's the rune magic. The runes are these very ancient symbols. You've probably seen some of them at one point or another. Some of them are quite simple. Some are extremely complex. All had a little bit of magic connected to them. And there's Sather or the witchcraft. So I do want to note for the sake of simplicity and clarity, I did draw starker lines between these different kinds of magic than um, are often presented in the Icelandic sagas themselves. In the sagas, there's a lot of crossover between the different kinds of magic. Um, kind of a lot of ways like they bleed into each other, but for this, the purposes of this story, I, I did draw some starker lines in what the magics accomplish. So, once you've done all your history research and technology research, if you're doing steampunk and your folklore research, and you really have a solid feel for the, the world at that time, how it functioned in real life, then you can put spins on it and fantasy it up. So I created an alternate Iceland for this story where steam powered technology, it's 
you know, all the rage around the world, been so for decades, it's finally starting to make its way into Iceland as Iceland's getting more economic and political independence from Denmark. It exists alongside the Viking Age magics, which are also still really prominent in this alternate Iceland, and the two kind of, you know, clash and cause some conflicts. I created an alternate Iceland where, as part of that 1874 constitution that I mentioned, which returned political powers to Iceland, I say in this, in my version of the story, that those powers came at the expense of magician freedom. So, part of the constitution required that all magicians had to register with the government and wear badges announcing, I'm a magician, I have these strange powers that you're not going to find in the rest of the world. And for for most of the magicians, the, the seeresses, the singing magicians, the rune magicians, the badges worked out fine because their magics are still respected in this story. And you know, the badges advertise their services and people come to them and they pay them money for their magic. But not the Sather, not the the witchcraft. Because, you know, think about it, in addition to Rockle's mind magic and her abilities to manipulate people's minds and play tricks on them. In the, in the Icelandic sagas, um, the Seithkonas, the witches, could also uh, take control of the weather, they could speak with the dead, they could cast curses on people, they could uh, send their spirits out of their bodies and go spirit walking, and it's like, if you knew someone who could actually do all of those things, you might be terrified of them. And so I leaned into that for this story. So the other magicians, as long as they register and they play by the rules, they're fine. But in in this story, the Sather or the witchcraft is considered too dangerous and wild for a world that's trying to go modern and civilized. So their magic is just outright banned, and any witch who was caught practicing her the Sather magic is swiftly arrested and sent to jail. So ultimately, with Wicked as the Witch, you end up with a story of a girl, Rockle, who is born with Sather, and she's told that she is wrong simply for existing. And people take advantage of her because of her vulnerable situation. You know, you have, she's stuck with a blackmailer who's like, you will use your magic for me to make me rich or I'm going to give you to the police. So, so by the end of the book, Rockle has to learn to embrace the aspects of herself that the world tells her are wrong, and she has to learn to fight back with them. So wrapping up again, um, as with any book, you're going to start with your premise. You're going to figure out when and where you want your historical fantasy to be set. You'll find a setting that suits this premise you're trying to build. Where, when and where in the world and in time it would be a great building point, great foundation for this idea of yours. Then research, 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 be prepared to... I spent months before I even started writing this book, researching, and I spent quite a few more months while writing it, researching. It's it's a big project to write historical fantasy. It's a big project to write something set in the real world. But once you've done all your research in history and folklore, then you get to do the fun part of fantasying it up and putting your own spins on it. Okay, got a little bit of time left to give you a sneak peek of Wicked as the Witch. So I'm gonna read you an excerpt from the second chapter so what's been happening is in the very first chapter of the book, Rockle is sent by her blackmailer master to go to the docks and chase down this secretary who works for a steam-powered company, the newest one in Iceland, and nobody knows who runs this company. The, the owner has kept very hush-hush secret, and the blackmailer is like, mm, there's probably a reason why it's kept secret, and it's probably going to be worth a lot of money to me. So he sends Rockle after the secretary, and he's like, you find out, and you don't come back without the man's name. And Rockle finds the name, but it's not a man's name. It's a woman who runs the company. So in this chapter, she is just returning back to the magic shop um, from the docks after finding out the woman who runs this steam-powered company. So she and she and her she's coming back with her brother Lafer, who. He does not have any magic, but he's very handsome and very charming and very charismatic, and he often goes with her on her on her secret little missions to mess with people's minds because he's really good at getting people to let their guard down and feel safe with him, and then Rockle swoops in and casts her spell on them and gets the answers that she's looking for. But they've come back from the docks. 
they're stepping back inside the magic shop where Anar keeps he keeps other magicians, regular ordinary magicians who sell spells to people who come to the shop and then Anar takes all their money because he's a terrible man. So Rockwell and Lifer are coming back inside. To pass through these doors is to step back in time. While everyone else in the city chases the 20th century, this shop masquerades as a Viking longhouse, hearkening to the days when Old Norse magic was a routine part of life. Rough-hewn tables and benches stand between thick pillars partitioning the shop. Seal skins and white fox furs drape across benches, while strings of dried fish, mutton, and herbs dangle from ceiling rafters. The only light comes from the fireplace burning chunks of peat and stone lamps filled with fish oil, with the smell to match. I wrinkle my nose. The first whiff is always an assault after breathing the clean sea air. A few customers remain at the tables, waiting for spells from Anar's three other indentured magicians, all of them gifted with lawful, accepted magics. Still, they're as trapped here as I am, Anar snaring each of us for the triple sins of being teens, naive, and desperate. Schooly, the shop singing magician, sits in one corner beside a mother and her baby, crooning an enchanted blessing over the child. As I step by, he nods, plucking his sleek black hair out of his face and peering at me with his one good eye. The other, lost in a farm accident years ago, is covered by a leather patch. At the next table over, Briette, the shop's Spaukona, rocks in her chair. Burrowed within a blue mantle wrapped around her shoulders, she spins thread from the magic wool atop her wand to scry the future of the young man fidgeting beside her. And Vigo, the rune worker, hunches at the third table. The sleeves of his leather tunic are torn off above the elbows, while the lacings are half undone, revealing runes tattooed across every visible inch of his arms and chest. He carves elaborate symbols, protective spells, into a square of birch wood for an old woman who natters on without ever stopping to breathe. Anar is nowhere to be seen. Another mercy, a blessed moment to myself. I yearn for a bath to at least pretend I'm scrubbing away my magic, but settle for warming beside the fireplace. The first burst of heat is like needles prodding my flesh, but soon the chill ebbs away, along with the fuzzy feeling that so often follows my magic, like my brain's gone to fleece. When the old woman and her baby leave, Scooley joins me, unfastening his cloak and hanging it on the wall. How did it go out there? Though I trust Scooley, I don't want to surrender such a potent secret yet. I learned interesting things. I'll bet you did. Vigo drops onto the bench beside the fireplace. He folds his arms across his chest, flexing his muscles in every rooney to cross them, as though that will intimidate me. Ignore him. Scooley hands me the poker. Here, stoke the fire. I'll start supper. But when Vigo has a grief on his mind, he won't let it go. What was it today, Teak? What secrets did you tear from that man's mind? My fingers curl so tightly, my nails cut into my palms. After every job, it's the same. Vigo blaring his left picked through his mind and pillaged his secrets. Yeah, yeah, Vigo. Leifer snatches a deck of cards from a table and points it toward the boy. You owe me a game of Gurkha. Don't worm out of it or I'll up your debt to two shots of Brennivine and collect both on Saturday. Vigo ignores my brother, glowering only toward me. His raw scorn is a tired song I'm sick to my bones of hearing. You know why I do this, I protest. It's not for the thrill. Your magic ruins lives. I wouldn't be stuck with Anar if it weren't for you. Oh no, he does not get to blame me for the sins of that wild young witch he once had the misfortune to love. Not me. I'm not her. He winces, positively cringes, as I'd hoped. But when I blink, his face shifts back to a sneer. Saith Konas are all the same. Filthy tricksters. Keep out of my head, you hear. Is anything there worth my time? Enough! Schooley shoves rye bread and a crock of skeeter toward Vigo. Eat! It's an obvious distraction. It works. Vigo spreads the soft cheese over the bread and chews with an unnecessary amount of noise. Lafer winks at me while sitting across from Vigo, occupying the rest of the boy's attention with a deck of cards. Here, Rockle, let's get some supper going. Schooley gestures me to his side. I whisper thanks to him for once again helping get Vigo off my back. Together we chop potatoes and parsley as Haddock poaches in milk over the fire. Schooley sings while stirring that, stirring that pot, keeping in time with our motions. I don't recognize this song. He must have learned it from his father. Schooley's mother helps her brother with a farm near the northern port city of Akureyri, but his father is a Chinese sailor who launches from docks down in Liverpool. Sometimes his boat stops in Reykjavik, and Schooley never misses the chance, however brief, to visit with him. As we cook, Briette hobbles over, tugging off her lambskid hood and digging through her long blonde curls, clutching her temples. Her blue eyes, as she turns to Schooley, are so unfocused that the hair on the back of my neck prickles. Is there any crowberry jam? 
He has the jar and spoon ready on the mantel. When he offers them, she grins, and a flush steals over Scooby's cheeks. Briette claims eating something sour snaps her back to the present when she's tangled up in the future. Waking dreams, she calls them, when the threads of fate overwhelm her senses with a thousand potential paths for everyone in her proximity. At least she can pick from those threads to explore what lies ahead for a particular person, making her useful to customers and profitable for Anar. Scooley turns back to the potatoes, though he keeps half his attention on Briette. Are your visions troubling today? It's the customers. Briette sucks a glob of purple jam off her spoon. Some people want me to promise the world without them doing a thing for it. That last one argued that he was paying me to detail his future, specifically whether he'd win over the girl of his dreams, though he clearly never says a word to her. The flush on Scooley's face deepens, and my goodness, it's adorable. Myself, I don't pine for others this way. Don't crave any romance with another soul. Never have. Don't know if I ever will. But I can certainly spot out when someone's being feather-headed about their own yearnings. Grinning, I prod Scooley between his shoulder blades. He jumps as though my fist is studded with pins. I'm sorry, he says to Briette, that your customers were difficult. They can demand whatever they want. Doesn't mean they'll get it. I'm just here for the crowberries. Briette winks, and Scooley looks like he'll melt all over the floor. The jam jar had emptied, and her gaze steady once more. Briette turns to me. How was the harbor? Was it wonderful to get fresh air, stretch your legs, watch the sea? I stare. She knows I don't go there for leisure. The Anar isn't granting me privileges he withholds from her. Yo, her headaches are awful, and some customers forget she's the messenger, not the creator, when they don't like the future she sees. But she's still a Spaukona. Briette has the best magic a girl can possess. An impossible beauty to match, with cascading golden curls, plump cheeks, and a round, full figure. She laughs often, but never too loudly, knows when to duck her chin and when to meet another's eyes. It's no wonder she smiles too much. Rockle. Briette furrows her brow, and somehow she makes even those lines elegant. Is something wrong? She leans closer, as though ready, expecting, to hear a secret. The shop door swings open, bringing in a burst of frigid air. Rockle mean, here you are, my wicked, filthy witch. His wretched sing-song tone twists my stomach in knots. Anar strides into the room, the thump of his cane turning each step into a declaration. He shucks off his velvet frock coat, tossing it at Lafer to hang on the coat rack, then straightens the satin amber vest hugging his slim torso. As he brushes away the flurries melting through his dark, curling hair, Anar observes me with a smirk. The man's powerful jawline and sculpted cheekbones daily turn the heads of teens half his age, along with silver-headed elders. But when he smiles, those full lips parting in a grin that softens his marble face and storm-gray eyes, the gesture makes him appear so real, so approachable, so utterly human. Once, I'd been tricked by that smile. I'd trusted Anar. Now, I know too well the serpent underneath. I don't remember much of my mother before I was taken from her, but she had a saying, a beautiful monster is still a monster, and the most dangerous of all. In the fish oil lamplight, Anar's eyes glint dark as the deep sea. If you're back, I trust you have worthy news to share, Rockle Mean. Mean, dear, as though I'm precious to him. Today's discovery will thrill the man, yet the words sit heavy on my tongue. I learned interesting things. I follow Anar up the narrow wooden stairs to his office. And that is my snippet of Wicked is the Witch. That is my presentation for today. Thank you everyone who joined in, listened to my world building process for secondary world and historical fantasy. If uh, We Are the Fire is up on Goodreads, so if that book sounds like your jam, please add it there. And again, the cover reveal should be coming before too much longer. Pre-order links should follow after that. And I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to participate in the Stamola Live workshop series. Again, want to give a shout out to my agency and a big thank you for arranging this whole series of events. There's more going on the rest of today, tomorrow, and all of next week as well. So if you are home with kiddos, if you have family or friends home with kiddos for the next few weeks with schools being canceled, let them know. There's a lot of other great events going on this week through the um, through the stimolalive.com. That's the website where you'll find it, stimolalive.com, with lots of Stimola authors and illustrators pitching in. So thanks everyone for joining in today. I hope that you enjoyed the snippets of stories I shared and my insights and processes into fantasy world building. Thank you.